Good evening. My name is Wolfgang Dansbeck Gruber. I'm the uh, director of the Liechtenstein Institute on Self Determination, and I'm delighted to welcome you to <laughs> a pretty special event, not all too far from the famous State of the Union night uh, of the United States. Um, and I do so in the name of the Liechtenstein Institute, but also obviously in the name of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And I do so with amazing pride, joy, and hope. It is my real great pleasure to introduce to you one of our long-term LISD associates, friends, fellows, Mrs. Fazia Kufi, who is now world famous for many things, but particularly for being the only woman who has so far officially announced its candidacy in the 2014 presidential race of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, whose flag you have here. And I dare say that I have followed um, Mrs. Kofi's progress, development, challenges since at least a decade now. Mrs. Kofi was born into one of Afghanistan's leading political families in the up northeast province of Badakhshan and has as papa a member of parliament who then died in the last year of the uh, first Afghan war and has then decided, and I say this to my young lady colleagues and also older lady colleagues, but especially to the lady colleagues, as a woman to A, convince her family that yes, she is worthwhile, and she wants to do it, to study it. And no, alas, she might not just not do a medical doctorate, but study politics. And um, in an amazing perseverance, putting her own ego behind that of her family, especially her two daughters, and trying to combat on a sweet, soft, but determined manner every day of her life Afghan traditions, Afghan male traditions. She began to develop her own special career. She joined UNICEF, and after joining UNICEF, where she worked for the protection of children and the education of children. She began in 2001, promptly after the fall of the Taliban, with this translated initiative to bring children back to school. We met first in 2002, and then in 2003 she attended our first Liechtenstein Colloquium on that part in the region. In 2005, Fazia Kofi was elected to the National Assembly for the Badakhshan District, and she became the vice president. And in 2006, on that very night, she was invited by President Bush to assist and attend the State of the Union address in Washington, D.C., and I will make sure that we all see this State of the Union address of President Obama today. And um, she um, then was there as the first deputy speaker of the new parliament of Afghanistan as a woman in the history of Afghanistan. And, um, in 2010, in the parliamentary elections, she became re-elected and is now one of 69 
female representatives in the parliament. <clears throat> Anybody of you who has ever been to Afghanistan or who has dealt with a staunch archaic male-oriented society can perhaps fathom that not everybody is particularly pleased of Fazia Kufi's career and of Fazia Kufi's deeds. And as I dare tell her occasionally, we only have that many lives. There were several attempts on her life already. And I assume that with her increased propensity to get a national, regional, and more and more international voice for Afghanistan, these challenges might increase. Fazia Kofi will presumably tell us many things about her vision for Afghanistan, about her perspectives on what the international community should be with Afghanistan and in Afghanistan. But I am not certain whether she tells us what I found should be for many of us a guidance is that how she managed to combine personal life, family, the orientation of motherhood and being there for the children with being challenged on an everyday basis by the sheer fact that she's a woman. And she managed to do so. And one of the more touchy books I have seen by any of my famous political friends in recent years is her collection of letters to her children, which, she, which are letters which she wrote in part when she said goodbye to her kids because it wasn't really certain whether they would see each other again. And um, I have to say, one of your colleagues, who was also here a couple of years ago, said once to me, you know, Wolfgang, we live with death on an hourly fact. We don't even know whether we have any medical care if something really happens. But he didn't express the combination of challenge and personal drive with this sort of forward-looking, hopeful orientation to the next generation as you build it in, any and everything you're doing. And so it is with a particular pleasure and really gratitude that I can present you here at Princeton a person which in the most challenging, if not for some time, antagonistic aspects of professional political life has managed to come out from the deep mountains up in Balakhshan and already now has transformed the future of that Afghanistan for which we have paid such high price in terms of blood and material resources and where, for me and for us here at Princeton, it has always been the most important, the fate of the individual man, woman, and child in Afghanistan, that they may have a more prosperous and peaceful and, again, stable developing future. And I think if there's ever been a hope for that, Madam, you are that. So with this, delighted to have you here at Princeton. Please welcome <laughs> Mr. Fazer. Thank you very much, uh, my good friend, Professor. I by no means deserve that introduction that you kindly made. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, it's a honor and a privilege to be among this, um, some um, uh, wonderful people here and at the very prestigious uh, institute uh, with the Wilson School, but also the Princeton University. Uh, this is my second time being here. Um, of course, there are uh, some changes since the first time I was here. Um, up to now, I remember when I was here back in 2009, um, still Afghanistan was uh, one of the world priority um, and the foreign policies of many countries. 
and the, the withdrawal and the exit strategy was still a baby which was just born. And as a three, four years after that, now I talk to you, I know that um, many perspectives have changed um, uh, about Afghanistan. I know that uh, you know the world leaders, uh, including uh, President Obama, um, and uh, many governments have um, you know different view. And I know that Afghanistan perhaps might not be any more um, a favorable agenda to talk about it. Um, we also have uh, the same impatience in Afghanistan. We would like to, we would have liked to see changes happen quicker, but um, but there are changes. Um, I mean. Uh, and now that I talk to you, um, and, we, and I know that many of you want to hear about withdrawal and post-2014, let me tell you that um, the, the main concern for many Afghans in Afghanistan is the, um, the uh, uncertainty about you know, what is going to happen in the peace process, uh, what is going to happen on the um, uh, decade of change, which is starting from 2014, uh, you know, how are we going to transit politically? Because that's the key. If we have a successful political transition and um, election that as a result of that um, um, accountable, strong government takes place and, uh, and that government takes responsibility for money of our internal homework, I think things will go to the direction that we all wish to. But in the meantime, there is also the worst case scenario, and I hope that that worst case scenario doesn't happen in Afghanistan. Um, I think uh, what basically most of you hear is uh, the, uh, about Afghanistan is the media. And I know that the media usually talk about you know, news, which um, is suicide bombing or killing. Uh, there is another face of Afghanistan that uh, for some of you who have not been there, it has been a hidden issue. We don't, uh, uh, the media don't talk about it. And also when we politicians come to uh, the Europe or Western capitals, we also, or, 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 or DC, or to the decision makers, we also try to talk about our problems to attract attention. We hardly talk about those progresses that have been made in Afghanistan. And I think one of those progress that is not measurable, it's not we cannot measure it. It's not a building that is built. It's not the number of schools that we sent. They are there. But it's the social changes that happen in Afghanistan. It's a transformation that happened in Afghanistan. Afghanistan right now is not the Afghanistan of um, 2001 or Afghanistan of 1996, when Taliban could rule uh, over um, people, including women, the way they want it. Uh, when there was this uh, civil war and, uh, you know, people, uh, for, for them to access basic food, uh, you know, they had to pay their life to get something from the shops. Right now, people of Afghanistan have really progressed. Uh, Afghan society is in two, in two parts. One is this transformed part of Afghan society, which have progressed and they would like to live in a situation where there is democracy, there is minimum standard of life, you know, people have a voice to say, there is freedom of speech, there is, a, you know, democratic institution like parliament functional, um, the government which is more responsible and accountable, the young generation that go to school and go to university, that is the transformed part of Afghan society, um, that we, we don't see it. Um, it has not been repor uh, reported to the media. And when sometimes I hear from different uh, you know, friends and uh, uh, commentators, when they say that democracy was imported to Afghanistan and Afghan people are never uh, pro-democracy, it doesn't work there, uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't buy that agenda because I don't buy that argument because, uh, you know, if democracy is about election, about people's participation, if democracy is about freedom of speech, I think we have some of the most vibrant media right now in Afghanistan. It's, um, you know, we have over 300 something radio stations. We have, uh, alone in Kabul, we have more than 25 TV channels that we sometimes have uh, difficulties in choosing which one shall we watch. Uh, shall, we, shall we watch to? We have, uh, you know, a newspaper that is brought to our doors every morning. Can you imagine? It, this was not even, uh, you know, it didn't happen. It was not possible two years back. I hardly could access a newspaper. Right now, each morning, there is this envelope of different kinds of newspaper that are brought to my door. And, you know, also to many other doors. Um, and that part of Afghan society, which is the transformed part of Afghan society, has little voice. They don't have strong voice in the palace. 
They don't have strong voice in the parliament. They don't have strong voice, uh, you know, at the international community level because international community also, when they go to Afghanistan, they would like to meet the big chunks, the big leaders, the, the one that ca can create troubles and can, uh, you know, become part of the troublemakers. The other part of Afghan society is this, um, I would say, conservative part of Afghan society that uh, they have a say in palace, they have a say in the parliament, they are within Taliban, they are everywhere. They have much more stronger voices. Um, they, they are much more, they have been leading Afghanistan for the past uh, uh, decades and centuries. They have been the leaders of the country, traditionally leading the country. Um, uh, their voices are much more stronger. So this is the change that I don't think it's uh, a river. I, th I don't think we could take it back. It's a change. It's unlike 20 years back when uh, the government in Kabul was backed by um, Soviet Union. The change was basically at Kabul level. When you talked about women, there was a group of elites that were at Kabul. When you talk about, you know, political and intellectuals, it was basically in Kabul. You go to the provinces, there, uh, that change has been less um, uh, seen in the districts and the villages. But right now, the change is happening from the villages and district. And when I say change, uh, I mean, even in, no matter where in Afghanistan, a mother wants to send her girl to school. Even in Kandahar, even in Helmand, places where there is, you know, they are regarded as um, red area, high, high, highly risk and threatened area, they want to send their daughters to school. I was the first girl from my family and from my village to get education. And for that, I really had to pay a high price. Every day, I had to look at different faces of my family who is happy to allow me to go to school. But now, from the same village, we have 10 female teachers. I don't think, think any of the Americans or Europeans uh, imposed that kind of perspective change to the people. Now people understand that it's important for them to send their girls to school. It's important for them to send their boys to school. It's important for them to ask for school. From some of the most conservative community, people ask to come to me and ask for girls' school. And I tell them why, like 20 years back, they were even hiding their boys to go to school. They wouldn't allow their boys to go to school because they think that if they go to school 20 years back, they will find an official identity within the government, and then they will have to go to become soldiers. And so to avoid that, they will even let them, don't let their boys to go to school. Right now, they ask, and ask school for their girls. And I ask them, why do you want school for your girls? They say, if my, my girl become like you, to be able to deliver services to his, her people, then I will want my girl to go to school. That is, I think, the perspective change. In 2010, parliamentary election. I'll give you another example. Uh, there is one province, if, if some people from Afghanistan are here, or if some people who have been to Afghanistan, they know that there is a province called Nimroz, which is bordered with Iran. It seemed to be one of the conservative provinces. And I see some, some of uh, you know, my friends here already um, uh, that I you know, haven't met during the... So that province is one of the conservative provinces. In the last parliamentary election, they have two seats. You know, we have woman quota uh, for the parliamentary. We have 27% women in the parliament, according to the quota. That province have two seats, one for man, one for woman. In the last parliamentary election, woman managed to defeat man. So both seats in that province are being occupied by women. Is, when people say democracy doesn't work in Afghanistan, is this like Americans or Europeans that went voted for that woman? No, it's people of that province who know that, you know, this lady has the capacity. On merit basis, she voted for that woman. As Professor said, in the history of Afghanistan, we never had a woman chairing the plenary. Like yourself, like 249 people who used to fight with each other, used to use guns and weapons against each other, were sitting in that plenary. Sometimes they were using the same color of card, either green or, or red, not weapon. And I was chairing that plenary. They were fighting for the, for the fact that they don't want to see a woman in public. But now they were sitting in a parliament when I was chairing the plenary. That has hardly been reported to you. 
I know that you have invested blood and treasure in Afghanistan, and the cost of that blood and treasure should be more gratefulness and appreciation, which we are thankful to, to you for that. But in the meantime, I know that there was a cause, and that cause was a common cause when you went to Afghanistan. Before 2001, people in Afghanistan were screaming that we are a victim of terrorism. Nobody was listening. The whole world was ignoring and saying, it's a civil war, let Afghans to deal with it. It was only 2001 when the 11 September attack happened. And the whole world came to this understanding that we have to do something about that part of the world. And therefore, you went to Afghanistan. Since then, I know that there were so many mistakes made by, by international community, by yourself, so many mistakes by us at the Afghan government level. I think we have, I think wrong role models have uh, represented us. By no means a stupid man who enters the house of civilians in the middle of the night, kill 16, 17 uh, civilian people, could represent the wish and willingness of U.S. people, I guess. It by no means can represent your wish of helping a nation. In the same time, by no means that soldier who is setting, uh, killing you know, American man on, or woman could represent the Afghan wish. So wrong, in, uh, wrong marginalized role models are not you know, the, 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 good, the good examples that we use. I know that perhaps it will be very difficult for me to convince American public uh, to continue to stay engaged in Afghanistan while you have lost many jobs, while you are suffering with your own economic uh, problems, while you have so many internal politics like we do. Uh, we do have those problems. But in the meantime, I want to make it a case that it's not only an Afghan war that you got involved. It has many dimensions, including regional dimensions. And now it has become a global uh, uh, problem for everybody. Therefore, you went to Afghanistan. 11 years have gone. In the 11 years, you expected more changes. We also expected, I don't think anybody, you know, will be impatient more than an Afghan girl who has to walk two hours to reach a school. She wants a closer school to be built for her. Um, we want to ch see changes quicker than, I guess, you, because we are the main victim. You know, we want to see governments that are more accountable and responsible for that. But I guess the problem was that we raised too much expectations initially. We thought Afghanistan could be changed to, to uh, uh, another, uh, perhaps, Switzerland in Asia, uh, which was wrong. It's a country that uh, is so much uh, different in, um, you know, geographically, it's socio, uh, you know, economically, it's a very complex country. Um, we have been dealing with issues for the past 35 years with war and conflict. So it was, um, it was unrealistic to raise that expectation on one hand. On the other hand, we also, you know, made mistakes. One of those mistakes was that a lot of money went to Afghanistan without prioritizing things, without making sure that actually uh, which ones are our priority, which one should be done first. As a result, um, you know, we end up being everything, so many things, uh, corruption uh, and other problems occurred. Um, uh, the other problem of, I guess, uh, international community was investing too much on individuals instead of uh, promoting the systems and the establishment. Um, and I guess uh, one of other mistakes was that uh, we really continue to support a very much centralized, centralized system instead of considering the different differences of Afghanistan and making a little bit decentralization of political as well as administrative and financial power. Uh, you know, and I guess the other uh, mistake was that uh, you all got involved in Iraq war and Afghanistan was not any more a priority for the world. And that was the time when you, you know, with insurgency and, and, and those people who wanted to create problems for Afghanistan, revised their strategy and they, they came back um, to, to, you know, with a stronger strategy. Because I remember in 2003 and 2004, but particularly between 2001 and 2003, one could sit in a car from Kabul and go to the Helmand, which seemed to be the highly threatened, insecure area right now. Man, woman, children, in, in the middle of the night, there was no problem. Where were Taliban by then? 
It was our mistakes that gave more power, gave more time for Taliban and insurgency to reemerge. And I hope, I hope that, that the international community don't repeat that mistakes that we have repeated so many times, and, and I'm seeing that it's going to happen with the withdrawal in 2014. And I know that uh, perhaps President Obama will have a new message for us this evening about withdrawal, but, uh, uh, or a repeated message which uh, is about exp uh, expediting the withdrawal. Um, I mean, Afghanistan has been a sovereign nation forever, and look at our history. We have always fought for sovereignty. Afghanistan was the reason which the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, and, and you, I'm sure you agree with me. That it was the resistance and the resilience of people of Afghanistan that resulted in, in uh, you know, collapse of Soviet Union. But when, when the whole world turned face from Afghanistan, and you came without even not having... Um, a U.S. embassy or presence in Afghanistan. That was the time the civil war began. That was the time that the Taliban came back. Um, and they, they, you know, the Taliban was established. So I hope that we don't go to the very, very recent history of Afghanistan, which in, in 1989, uh, the, you know, the, the Soviets left and then um, the, the power was handed over to Mujahideen. And as a result of that, the civil war began. I hope that uh, the world will handle with, uh, Afghanistan case with uh, more of responsibility and more of uh, looking, it, uh, looking as the, uh, at Afghanistan in a way that it's not just an Afghan issue. It's more of a regional, re regional and, and uh, um, you know, a global problem, but regional in a way that our neighboring countries are right now trying to reshape themselves as we are coming closer to the 2014. They would like to... Inter, you know, they would like to influence the situation in Afghanistan. They would like to you know, see their own elements that are uh, that, that that get more power in in Afghanistan, and that's a concern. And if the international community like turn face and come back at this situation, without you know longer-term political, longer-term financial commitment to Afghanistan, the fear is, the fear is that in the worst-case scenario, that very recent part of history might repeat again. And the main victim of that will be women and children, because it was women and children who paid a high price. It was either a woman father or husband or son who got killed in the war, and the responsibility of the family came to the, to the woman who was not educated. She had to take responsibility of the children. She didn't have enough money to send her boy to school. And the next generation of uneducated came out, and partially they became Taliban. So certainly we don't want to repeat those mistakes that, uh, you know, our, the universal values that we stake ourselves to it uh, get undermined. And one of those universal values are the issue of, uh, you know, women rights in Afghanistan. I think uh, this has been one of the main achievements of international community uh, and the people of Afghanistan. And I think uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are universal standards that one has to go. And those, um, those achievements that we have had in terms of women political participation, women social participation, you know, uh, economic uh, access for women, that in the villages you go right now, you see women are part of the city, the um, community development councils, you see women are part of local provincial councils, you see women are in the parliament, but that is not only quantity. I mean, quantity does matter because, you know, you have to have an entry point to ensure that, uh, that, uh, that, that there is a quality representation, but also quality-wise. I mean, the days that I don't appear on TV, because we do appear on TV so much on, uh, in Kabul, that the days that I don't appear on TV, people know that I'm not in Afghanistan. <laughs> So that's how they monitor our presence. Like if I don't appear so much, they know that I have perhaps left to some, uh, you know, foreign uh, foreign mission. That level of like closeness and uh, accountability, uh, and also the level of being, uh, you know, accessible to people by the woman is there. And I think that is something we cannot afford to lose it. And therefore, we need solidarity from our sisters initially, but also our brothers. Uh, to to, uh, to uh, su extend their support for Afghan women. I don't buy this argument when people say that, well, Afghans have been dealing with their traditional issues forever. Women of Afghanistan have been suffering from such problems forever. It's not true. It's actually the result of war that has imposed such uh, suffering and trouble for women. When, my, when I was a kid, baby, my mother never knew what's war. But my children are grown up with war. And they hate to see people with, you know, sometimes when we go to the streets, I see the tension in their faces when they see people with weapons and guns. 
I'm sure none of us in this room want to see our children and, 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 and grandchildren to be afraid of anything in their life. We want them to be brave, and so Afghan woman and Afghan mother wants to see their children go forward. And therefore, I think we need your support on that. But Afghan woman cause is not ju just the only cause that we need your support. The only alternative for Afghanistan right now is democracy. If not democracy, what else? Are we ready to have another Talibanized regime in Afghanistan? Are we ready to have another uh, Islamic, you know, under the name of Islamic Emirate, but an, uh, uh, an Islam that as a Muslim woman, I'm not familiar with it, and many Muslim scholars around the world don't buy it? Are we ready to have another Islam, another, another regime in Afghanistan that a woman cannot go to see a doctor without a male companion? And what happens if a woman doesn't have a male companion? Shall she borrow a male companion? That's what I did. When they put my husband in jail and I wanted to go and see him, the taxi driver told me that he was nice, one of those gentle Afghan men. He told me that, you know, mom, I cannot take, take you because Taliban will stop us and ask me question, what is your relationship with her? So we need to make already a relationship to take you. And then the, the relationship was that he is my brother and I'm his sister. And so we exchanged the name of father, and that's how he took me to, to see my husband in jail, in prison. As woman who would like to have, uh, and as man who would like to have basic, basic rights for yourself, do you really want to see in other parts of the world that people are suffering from, from such kind of problems? I'm sure no. That's why you are here. So the alternative for, 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 for democracy at this stage, I don't see for Afghanistan. Yes, democracy has its problem in Afghanistan. Yes, there are corruption. Yes, there is lack of rule of law. Yes, there is poverty. There is lack of you know, accountability to the people when it comes to their problem. Yes, people need more social services. Um, people need more accountability. Uh, certainly, I, as a you know, member of parliament, I don't want to sit in a car which is so bumpy in the streets of Kabul. And certainly, I don't want to go to the village to see that a woman has to, has to walk four hours to fetch water for her family. We want to see those indicators improve. And certainly, I don't want to see a mother. That is, this is something I have been seeing in my life. To access a, a health clinic, to deliver a baby, she has to walk one week. And in complicated case of delivery, she has to take a donkey, and a pregnant woman cannot sit in a donkey. Can you imagine how she will face this situation. We all want to see those indicators get improved, but that will not happen if there is no accountable elected government, if there is no democracy. So we need to, we need to ensure that this political transition from now to 2014, the election happens before, uh, in the, to the minimum standards, before uh, uh, the military transition happens. And therefore, I think that's our responsibility at uh, DC, at Afghanistan. There are certain things that it's our homework. There are certain things that it's the responsibility of international community to ensure that there is fair and fine elections. The first thing is that ensure that there is enough budget for elections. The second thing is that we need to ensure that there are independent electoral bodies including the, you know, the personnel, the staff, the chairperson, those who work at the election commission, they are neutral and they are respectful to democracy. They are not you know, related or affiliated with uh, one individual and work on that favor. We need to ensure from now to 2014 that the electoral reforms in the election law are brought. This is something we are working. It's a, one of our legislative priority. As we go, I go back and the parliament resume its work, we will work on the, on the electoral law to ensure that there is more polling stations for people. Um, that will avoid a uh, woman, you know, long walking, and women could get out of their houses and villages and vote. Of course, there were many, uh, many problems with the previous election, including the 2009 that women Votes were used on their behalf, the, the proxy votes and the fake vo votes. This is something we would like to avoid. We would like to make sure that women get the required civic education to know that how much it's important for them to get out of their houses and vote. Women mobilization, but the whole society mobilization is important. I know there are questions about security um, of the election. I know that there are questions about inclusiveness, but with all the problem, we need to have election for a political transition. To, to ensure that there is a strong, decisive, uh, accountable government in place. So 
electoral reforms are one aspect of it, but in addition to that, they are needed for establishing uh, coalitions and political groups and, and, and uh, promoting the right candidate to bring changes for Afghanistan. Because I think perspective of the society is ready for change. The silent Afghan majority want to live in minimum standards of democracy, if not, if not to the maximum. Post-2014 is a big question for Afghan uh, people, and I guess it's, it is for our international community. Um, recently, there is this uh, transition uh, program that uh, um, Afghan forces take responsibility from international forces. We have PRTs, they are the provincial reconciliation team in each province, that they gave responsibility to Afghan forces, our um, police and army. Uh, the motivations and the morale of our police and army is incredible. I'm sometimes really, sometimes really proud of those forces that with empty hands, they fight terrorism. Recently, last year, there was an attack on, um, well, actually, it was last year. In May, there was an attack on parliament by Taliban. It's interesting to see that this Afghan uh, brave soldier who is already injured, and you see that blood is coming from his part of body. He is fighting from down a block. It's a long, it's a very tall block, and uh, and the Taliban are on top of the block. They are fighting down, and they are like in a main important strategic location. But this Afghan soldier is fighting him from down, from the street, with a very um, old uh, clashing kuf. He knew that he might get killed. But he wanted to at least protect his democratic institution, which is the parliament. Last year, there was another attack on uh, NATO and, uh, and um, uh, I think, US uh, embassy in Afghanistan. And there was a suicide bomber who came close to a bus station to explode himself and kill a lot of civilians. The Afghan soldier, when he knew, and he is the father of four children, when he knew that this is a suicide bomber, he went and hold the suicide bomber and threw himself with that suicide bomber to a, you know, a corner which exploded and both of them were killed. That way he avoided civilian casualty. He avoided ordinary people to be killed. That is the morale and the motive of our forces. But unfortunately, it's only in 2008 when uh, the international community started supporting our forces. They started supporting our forces by, in terms of equipment and capacity too late. And now the, tar the rocket the Taliban attack could target could target 20 kilometers. And the rocket that our forces use could target three kilometers. So we need to ensure from now up to 2014, we give enough equipment and supply to Afghan forces um, that they are able to stand against the, this um, regional phenomenon. And, and to protect uh, Afghanistan from a situation where it could be a potential, again, safe haven for terrorism if we don't take it serious. On the transition, the other element that we hardly talk about is, uh, and that is, uh, again, the responsibility of all of us, is the financial implication of the um, uh, transition. Already when there is less appetite on the ground to invest, people are losing job. Translators and those who have been working with companies, they are losing job. And my fear is that the economy implication of, uh, of transition will be more on, on women. Because um, ISAF and NATO do their procurement and whatever supply procurement through the government of Afghanistan. And the government of Afghanistan, being a ma male dominated government, they favor man contractors. So women contractors have started to losing their contracts as well. So I think if women are not economically empowered, what happens is a woman is not able to, to feed and send her child to school. And then we will have another generation of uneducated people another generation of uneducated brother who will not send her sister to school. Therefore, we have to look at longer term uh, strategies that how we could you know, walk alongside this transformation in Afghanistan 
and you know, um, reduce our intention and, and our appetite that we should get out of Afghanistan quickly. I know that there are several, several you know, anti-war movements and peace movements in your countries that they believe there is human rights violation and it happened during war. That's true. As a civil society activist, as a mother, I don't want to hear anymore the voice of shooting. I want my daughters to watch cartoons and, let, and enjoy that. But one has to look at the other picture of the story. What happened if tomorrow the same daughters that I want them to watch cartoons and movies are exposed to stay home, they are pressurized to stay home and don't go to school because the government, in this case Taliban government, don't want girls to go to school. I'm sure that if you balance between two, I will go for that, that I allow my, my new generation of Afghanistan to have the opportunity to get education. And when we have an educated nation in Afghanistan, they could be a reliable partner and reliable um, you know, supporters and working with you alongside, for, alongside for, for our values of democracy. We want to have an Afghanistan where it's not regarded as a country that only gets donations, but a country that is a reliable partner to the world. Th these are the things that we are working. Afghanistan is not chronically a poor country. I'm sure you agree. It's a rich country. We have billions of dollars underground uh, for natural resources. We need to make sure that those, those uh, uh, underground natural resources are used for the interests of Afghanistan, not for individual pockets. We need to ensure that those uh, uh, mines are used to create jobs for Afghan people. So the, a young Afghan graduate boy doesn't have to go become Talib just to find some source of money, some source of income. We, Afghanistan is located a, at a very important geographical location that connects Central Asia to South Asia. Right now it's our weakness because everybody, it has become a battlefield between different countries in the region. We would like to change that as a, as a um, uh, strength by increasing business between Central Asia, South Asia, and Afghanistan, a safe place to transit this business. Those are the, 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 the wishes that we want to have for Afghanistan. We will not be able to, come, uh, to make our wishes come true if there is no security, if there is no peace. I know that uh, there is the so-called um, peace process that for me, I have always been the critics of this process. It's, it looks like a project because process is like democracy. Like democracy is a process. You, have, you include people, you, you know, mobilize people to support um, certain, and you, and you make a social contract between governments and the voters for certain accountability. That's how the peace process is. We need to ensure that there is certain accountability from two sides. Uh, I know that the United States government is pursuing the Qatar uh, office. I hope uh, they will make sure that there are women in included in that. I uh, heard President Obama speaking with our president at the press conference, um, you know, that uh, he uh, assured Afghan women that the their rights will be safeguarded. But that assurance, we want to come in practice. It cannot, we cannot stand behind, you know, uh, uh, stages and say it. it has to come to practice. That means women issues and their participation not only quantity participation that amassed, but their quality participation in terms of the issues of concern should be on the table, on the negotiation table, and there should be some red lines that we cannot cross them. Afghan constitution is one of those red lines. Their part, woman political social participation, basic freedom for women is the other red line that we cannot cross. We want peace with justice. We cannot pay for one for the other. I know that everybody wants to settle this political settlement before 2014. Everybody is in a hurry. But, you know, um, history tells us that if we do things that are not matching the ground realities in Afghanistan, we will fail. And the, the other point on the peace and reconciliation is that it has to be one unified voice from the international community. You know, different countries cannot pursue different, different programs. We cannot, I, I think it will confuse our foundation to, see, to hear a six months peace plan from one country, another plan from another country. It has to be led by Afghans and its institutions, with including women, 
including civil society, including the activists in Afghanistan, including the political opposition reformists in this process, and the government of Afghanistan. We need to sit and honestly present our issues and see how much Taliban have changed. I would be glad to see how much Taliban have changed in their perspective. I don't want to hear this change from my minister. I want to hear it from the Taliban. I want to receive an assurance from Taliban that they will not stop my daughters as they did stop me from going to school. And this is something we also need your support on that. I mean, as, as, as global partners and somebody, as I assume many of you that are here, you have an interest and your people with very good heart about things of um, concern for human being. We need your solidarity and support in lobbying at the you know, politicians level that women of Afghanistan voices, their participation, their concerns, and nation of Afghanistan voices should be on the negotiation table. We cannot continue to have dialogue behind the curtains. There should be transparency on this process. And, and that will give an assurance to, to us in Afghanistan that you know, we are going on the right direction. And I think the element factor of peace uh, with the honest engagement of our neighboring countries is a must. Because um, if you don't, don't have honest um, and you know, continued support from our uh, neighboring countries, uh, mainly Pakistan and Iran, it's not going to work. We, they will have to get involved because we know they, they play an important role in this. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, you know, that progressive part of Afghan society, which I talked about, and, and I said that those progressive part of the Afghan society has been less represented at national and international level. Therefore, I think it's our turn to stand at the national level and international level to represent that progressive part of society. And therefore, I decided to run. I know the challenges. Some people ask me question, is Afghanistan ready? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a mindset, it's a mentality uh, we all create for ourselves. I know, you know, it's so difficult to get to that position in Afghanistan, but a much more difficult must be to be in that position, to run a country where it has been through 35 years of war and conflict. But as somebody who lived all my life in Afghanistan, I know A to Z of politics in Afghanistan. I know A to Z of my people demand. I know what, how shall we make priorities? I know how shall we make Afghanistan a reliable partner for its citizen, a reliable country for its citizen and partner to the world. And those are my passion. My strength is my people. They have demonstrated in the past two elections that they, they have supported me. And I, tr I believe that they will continue to support me. What I need is somehow solidarity from all of you. Thank you very much. certainly carried many messages. Um, Milady, you have agreed to take some questions? Please, the floor is yours. For all ages, especially the younger ones. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, well, it's, 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 it's several things that I, I find that Thank you for coming. Um, there's several things that I find that in looking at the Afghanistan, I don't want to say the Afghanistan problem, but some of the issues that are in Afghanistan that, um, uh, okay, I'll just say that. Is there a class issue in, in Afghanistan? Term limits, drugs, the drug problem that's going on because people are dealing with war and that's how they've, they've, they've um, come to, to deal with those particular issues. Um, and um, loyalty and patriotism. How do you, how do you uh, uh, encourage that in a region that's so tribal? Thank you. I will uh, start uh, with your last question of uh, loyalty and uh, you know the love for the country. I think we all love our country, but it depends on how. What is the approach? that we take to contribute in the reconstruction and, and, and rebuilding of Afghanistan. Um, you know, 
I believe that the elements of war in Afghanistan are, the, um, are not an, just an Afghan element. I think there are many intelligence involved, and they are basically working for the intelligence of other countries. Therefore, they have very little support in Afghan society. Even if people are not happy with the current government, like some of us are not, because of the low performance, but we certainly don't want to see a Taliban government because we know who they are pursuing, who they are, whose agenda they are following in, in, in Afghanistan. The drug problem, it is, because we have been living in war, it's a problem. One of the challenges we have among security, corruption, and the third one is the drug problem. But uh, I'm sure you agree with me that Afghanistan is not a demand country, it's a supply country. <laughs> drug is being trafficked, unfortunately, to other parts of the world. So therefore, we need a, once again, a honest uh, regional uh, uh, battle for this issue, that we had little support on that. Um, but people don't talk about other nice things we have. They don't talk about nice fruit we have. They don't talk about the karakol we have. They don't talk about Afghan beautiful rag. They don't talk about uh, you know uh, the, the nice uh, um, uh, uh, precious stones like lapis lazuli and uh, you know ruby, other nice things that we have. Those are nice things for business. You know why are we going to make? drug business in Afghanistan. I think they should, we have to look at other options in Afghanistan too. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming, really appreciate it. Um, so it sounds, uh, Hamid Karzai was here about a few weeks ago at the White House with President Obama, um, and it sounds like in a post-2014 Afghanistan, the combination of U.S. troops and NATO troops will be about around 10,000, give or take a few thousand, uh, which is certainly a lot less than it currently is right now. Um, but my question is, if you are elected president of Afghanistan next year and President Obama invites you to the White House for a one-on-one -on -one meeting, the first meeting uh, between both of you, what would you say to President Obama with regard to the post-2014 situation in Afghanistan? Would you, um, would you like the, the 10,000 troop number? Would you like more or less? Um, how would you like to see them, both the U.S. troops and NATO troops, assist the people of Afghanistan once we're in less of a combat situation and the Afghan troops take over most of the operations? Well, uh, you know that we are in the negotiation stage with uh, the United States government about um, security partnership, um, which basically uh, framework the uh, U.S. engagement in Afghanistan post-2014, particularly about the number and the modality of the troops on the ground. Um, for me, honestly, the number doesn't make a big difference. For me, the commitment is important. I certainly, when I say that the early withdrawal uh, could result problems in Afghanistan, I don't mean I want to see a U.S. soldier in each street of Kabul with military. What I mean is that the, the morale, that the, 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 the message that it gave to our neighboring countries, the message it gave to the Taliban, that message is not uh, um, for the interest of both Afghanistan and international community. So um, I certainly think that um, my message when I see as a president of Afghanistan, your president, would be that please go to the places where the source of terrorism is coming. Where, you know, terrorism get their training, their source of funding, please get engaged in those places. Thank you. Miss, yes, please. Um, Ms. Kofi, thank you for coming. It was an honor to hear you speak. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the role of women in Afghan society. Just going forward, how do you think um, the international community and the Afghan government can sort of help advance the role of women um, and their status in society? Do you see it through economic participation, political participation, civic? It's a combination of all, actually. Uh, luckily, uh, quantity-wise, we have um, quite a number of women in the parliament. Afghanistan has 27% uh, of women in the parliament. And in the United States, you know what is the percentage? It's 19%. I think you should improve it. <laughs> <laughs> That political, political participation that makes, um, that uh, allow women to get to the power position 
and that will influence the society. Like, for instance, we are in the parliament right now lobbying for the law on violence against women, which is one of the most difficult laws to be approved. Issues that were regarded as part of tradition, like beating of a woman, physical abuse, like, you know, to somehow sexual abuse, depriving a woman from her property right, for instance, um, early marriages, forced marriages. These issues were, that were regarded as part of Afghan woman life, we put it in this law as a violence, as, as a crime. So we have difficulty appro approving this law. There are few, very few uh, MPs that are opposing it. Hopefully we will get it approved. Uh, we are working with the government, of, with the executive, with the palace basically, to ensure that there is one woman in the Supreme Court because we, we think that that's an entry point and it will give an assurance that next time there will be two women. Um, at the provincial council and province level, we are promoting to have more women as district manager. We have the first woman district manager who was appointed three weeks ago or four weeks ago. Um, uh, and, and so it continues like that. Um, unfortunately, yes, we have a reduction in some areas. For instance, according to the Afghanistan national strategy, development strategy, we needed to have by 2013, 30% uh, of women in civil service. It has reduced. We have 18 to 20 percent. Um, it goes basically to corruption, to the favorism, all of other elements that we are working on it. Uh, but, um, but I think women economy and political participation, they are too interlinked. If I was not economically independent, I would not have not been where I am now because I had a job, a salary, and this is something we are trying to promote uh, for, for post-2014 uh, for women to have more economic um, access to capitals, basically. Uh, engaging in, in, in um, agriculture and income generation for, for women because that's very important. Um, you, know, if a, you know, if a woman is not economically empowered, she will not have a say in, at, at home, Le uh, you know, let alone the society. So we are uh, lobbying with the government and international community to have 30% of all the money that comes to Afghanistan that was committed, 60 billion $16 billion was committed for Afghanistan in Tokyo conference, which was held in June, last June. We have uh, lobbied with the government of Afghanistan to allocate 30% of that for women economic empowerment and small businesses. Um, and we asked the government to, uh, that is also for international community, but the government to have five female ministers. So we are really struggling. Um, but in the meantime, you know, woman issue, it's not an issue to, to work on. It's like every day you have to basically put your forehead in the stone when you are working on women issues, and we do that. The good thing is that there is more awareness about, uh, you know, about their rights among women. That awareness sometimes leads to more clashes in the family and, and uh, domestic violence, but I think this is part of this transition that we might uh, move. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Those of you who would like to speak, if you please come to the microphone. Um, hi, my name is Alex Elfakir. I'm an undergraduate. Thank you again for coming out this evening. Um, when creating policy, it's always um, it's always an important part to kind of look at things when they go wrong necessarily and plan for contingencies. So not just necessarily um, talk about the idealistic, what should the U.S. do, what should the world do to make things go right. I would like to present to you three cases that could happen in the next year where I think things could be difficult, not necessarily worst case scenarios, but um, things that would be difficult. And I would like to maybe hear um, how you think they might turn out or what you expect um, or think the international community, particularly the US, should do in those cases. The first, um, a really close political election. Um, obviously something that would be marred by um, maybe you know discrepancies in votes, something that would be very difficult to say you know who won but still a participation in democracy, so definitely a victory on that front, but something that would be very difficult to decide. The second, I would say, is Karzai decides to go for a third term or is some way involved in um, pushing a candidate such as his brother to the forefront, which, again, may be a success as far as election goes, but maybe, let's say, he pushes the election date past the U.S. withdrawal, obviously something you wouldn't necessarily want, not true democracy. And the last one, a little more morbid, um, the U.S. withdraws and uh, the Taliban strategically, let's say, waiting for that withdrawal uh, does go on a strategic offensive, both uh, you know, as far as um, propaganda and also in military terms. 
um, and say it is supported, as you said, by a strategic important actor, Pakistan. Um, and as the U.S. military fears, say the Afghanistan army does not live up to its expectations that we so all hope for, what then? Thank you. No, th these are very important questions, and I, I see you have lots of um, information and the, uh, information about Afghanistan, uh, or the ground situation. About the election, I think I touched uh, base uh, briefly, but uh, uh, I think as you, we may need water and milk three times a day, or four times or whatever, that much uh, people in Afghanistan talk about elections every day at their dinner, lunch, <laughs> breakfast. Because if we fail in 2014 election, that is a fail that we will, we cannot afford to pay for it. Um, yeah, there were four elections before, one in 2004, five, nine, and 10. But the coming election is key for us to have a successful election for primarily reason that you know, the US will, will, will withdraw, international community, and we have to stand on our feet politically as well. Therefore, it's important for us. There are a few things that uh, we need to make sure that it happens. First of all, a political um, pressure that we need to have elections on due time. Because for me, postponing of election once means you continuously keep postponing election, and you can do that. Constitution-wise, we need to stick to the election date. It's announced right now, next year, April. We have to stick to that with all the problems of geographic that in many areas, people, it will be very difficult for people to access uh, polling stations, especially the area that I come from. But what we try to do is to increase, uh, num in the electoral law, to increase number of polling stations so that everybody could access. The second thing uh, is once we are assured that elections will happen, and that I think, uh, I was really happy to see the remarks by um, uh, you know, John Kerry, the um, Secretary of um, State, uh, in his before appointment, he made it clear that you know, we cannot afford to not have elections in Afghanistan, so different actors should know that we should have elections. Um, so some political pressure from different actors' side, especially those countries that they fund elections in Afghanistan. The second thing, there are some issues that are our, our homework. We need to reform electoral law, um, election structure law. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, you know uh, um, mechanisms are put in place to uh, that gives us some uh, uh, hope and some assurance for transparency in the ele election. These words of transparency and fairness are like uh, dreams that we see them in the election. I hope it will come true, but we need to make sure that to some extent. Right now in March, um, the the chairperson of election commission term is going to finish. So president has all the right, uh, because we haven't approved the law yet, according to the previous law, to appoint a new chairperson. The independency and neutrality and professionalism of that new person is so important for us. Because it, if a, a chairperson of election commission is you know, somebody who is related to uh, certain political people, he has all the power to fabricate the election result first, to postpone the election announced due to security or unforeseen situation, elections are postponed. He has all the power. And our fear is that if it's appointed by people who are close to palace or in the palace, then he might favor them. Therefore, I think uh, uh, during my meetings with certain people here at DC and um, you know here, I, um, I know it's on the record, I hope that, uh, uh, that we, we make all our efforts that um, the electoral bodies and institutions in Afghanistan are independent so that people trust the future elections. We don't certainly want to damage the trust of people at this stage, which is very early. Democracy is still a child in Afghanistan. Uh, that the third thing is um, political coalitions for a change. I know. Uh, um, Constitutional-wise, President Karzai has no right to run for third time. But I know there are all rumors and gossips about uh, certain candidates. If the political uh, oppositions and coalition don't come together and don't agree on you know, one candidate at least, then there are all chances 
that whoever is favored by palace get elected because they have all means in their hands. They have uh, security in their hands. They have everything in their hands. The third thing is that we need to make sure that everybody at least participate in election. So we need a, a security plan, really. And that security plan cannot be alone by our forces. We need to, because sometimes those forces, especially when we have militia, local militia get involved in security of election. Under the name of Arbakis or, uh, I don't know, local police, if they get involved in security of election, that means they could also inf influence the voters by pressure. So therefore, I think uh, involvement of um, NATO ISAF forces for security of election is important. Um, I think on the Karzai issue, I briefly um, mentioned um, on the uh, you know, worst case scenario, we hope it doesn't happen, but uh, the worst case scenario is if there is no clear uh, uh, political transition and as, as a result, an accountable government doesn't take place and U.S. and in domestic politics uh, withdraw from Afghanistan and we don't come to a clear conclusion on the peace and on the strategic partnership with the United States, uh, military partnership, Taliban might you know, keep quiet till then and then come back. I'm sure they will not be able to come back to the level that they were ruling Afghanistan because there is a public resistance against them. In, 2000, in 1996, when they came back, people didn't know who they are. There was a lot of contradictory around them. But now we know them. So, but there will be all the possibilities for I mean, another conflict, um, internal conflict in Afghanistan. And, and when there is an internal conflict, which we hope we don't get to that point, we're all hopeful for a best case scenario, uh, when we go to that level, then Afghanistan once again can be a safe haven for Al-Qaeda and their supporters to promote themselves, to plan agenda, and the world will not be safe once again. Yes, please. Thank you for that wealth of information tonight. You should go to the microphone. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, the if, if uh, there are feminist movements in, Pakistan, in Afghanistan uh, that try to strive for gaining more rights for women through the confines of uh, Islamic tradition, and also, especially when it comes to property, uh, you know, the rights for property and, it, and education. Thank you. If, before you uh, go, I would like to tell you that we are going to have a public reception afterwards. So those of you who can't ask all the questions then have the chance to uh, uh, talk uh, personally. Um, would you, did you take note of the question? Yes, I yeah. could. Could you collect, uh, yes, connect sure, another sure. one also, please? Thank you so much for these uh, very powerful words. Uh, my name is Sadaf Jaffer and I'm a doctoral student at Harvard University. And my question for you is, for those of us in this room that could possibly write to our elected representatives in the United States, if there was one issue that you would like us to really write about or to write about how we, the American people could support the people of Afghanistan, what would that issue be? Thank you. That's very hard, one issue. We have so many issues. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. On the feminism, I think, um, I think our mo movement in Afghanistan is within an, um, an Islamic rights of women. You know, what we really want is Islamic rights of women because that is something that has not been given to us. Mm -hmm. Under the name of, uh, you know, sometimes um, misinterpretation of uh, um, Islam, it's women who actually pay the high price. So therefore, uh, our demand is Islamic access of right to property, women to property, the right to marriage, all those basics that were there when Islam was first established 1,400 years back. Uh, because we don't have women who interpret uh, Islam. It's all being interpreted by man. Therefore, you know, we accept whatever comes. And I think, uh, therefore, we need to really ask for an Islamic rights of women in Afghanistan. And our move, you know, it, we cannot be in the middle of two extreme. We have experienced the very, very left extreme during communist back regime, and we have experienced the very, very right extreme during Taliban regime. We now have to shape ourselves in the middle and see what, how, what strategy works for Afghanistan so that we don't face backlashes. And that is, you know, that's why we have 
arrange our movement. Uh, it has not yet become a movement, but our moves in a way that uh, we ask within what we believe is our right in Islam. Even with that, we face challenges in our parliament. Sometimes uh, um, our male colleagues uh, say that, you know, you have, you, you women try to bring Western cons concepts of women right to us, which is, which is not true. We do uh, stick to some universal values, which are common in the United States, common in, 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 in UN and EU, but we also try to make, make it according to our own demand what women of Afghanistan want. Certainly women of Afghanistan, that their priority is not to, be, to look um, you know, like, uh, like women in the United States. Our priority is as a human being to be respected. That is our fight. On the one issue, it's like, uh, it's a challenge now, one issue. I think as a woman, that one issue is that uh, that will cover uh, peace and, and, and women rights and human rights in Afghanistan would be that uh, the United States Congress and Senate, that are one of the leading nations now in peace process, uh, they should ensure that women rights and children rights and democracy in Afghanistan is not a matter of compromise. Mm. It's very powerful. Yes, sir, please. Well, thank you very much for speaking, and I, I can safely say that after listening to your passion and compassion, the way you have put together your, your presentation tonight, if most people in Afghanistan are speaking your language, then the future is good and safe, because uh, it's very heartening to hear all the good words you've used. I do want to have uh, your uh, kind of opinion and reflection on two, three things. The first is equity and justice. Um, first is what? Equity, equity, equity and, and justice. justice. Okay. Um, all, these, all this talk of guns and ammunition and democracy means nothing if the people don't have justice. Uh, judicial system, judiciary throughout the country is extremely important so that they are able to fairly impart justice to the people. And if that's not happening, or if I haven't heard anything from anyone, you know, neither in the media nor the consultants that come up on the TV, and tonight, I, uh, I know you mentioned justice once or twice, but the more emphasis, in my opinion, is on judiciary, uh, the safer the future. The second thing, again, I haven't heard from anywhere and would like to hear, uh, what's going on with food production, small industries, cottage industries? Where is, the, where is the actual production of the country headed? What about power generation? You know, what's happening in that direction? Because if you, will, if you won't have this infrastructure, no matter how much we'll uh, use the code words of Taliban or Al-Qaeda or whatever, it, you know, it's not happening. You, we've got to have a country that needs to go forward. The third thing that I kind of, I probably would have not brought it up, but since you're speaking with such clarity and passion, I want to bring it up. And I want to bring it up in the context of Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan gets uh, whipping everywhere. Uh, it's very easy to get up and start whipping up Pakistan. It's politically favorable to whip Pakistan anytime we feel like. But uh, Pakistan was one place where both sides uh, the current leadership, which is in power in Kabul, and the current leadership, or whatever the leadership is, it may not be in power in Kabul. Both sides took refugee, refuge in Pakistan. Millions and millions of people. Pakistan was a host to a whole bunch of people. Uh, took care of a lot of Afghans without asking for anything. And uh, the, the reward that they got was, that the Pakistanis feel, uh, was um, the country that was actually supporting uh, the Soviet puppets, India, got a power play into, into Afghanistan after the 9-11. So do, do you think in reflection, and do you think going forward, can this issue be addressed in some way that let's bygones be bygones, let's have good relationship with Pakistan, and maybe marginalize India to the extent that they need to be. I mean, India is involved, but it needs to be marginalized in some way so that the relationship with Pakistan is not put on a wrong foot. So those are the two, three things I'd just like to get your passion. And good luck. You know, you are, you're doing a phenomenal job, and I, I wish you guys all the best. Thank you. Um, I guess I will start with the last point, which was um, about uh, Pakistan. Um, I know that uh, many of our leaders have um, unfortunately spent most of their time in Pakistan and Iran, and that's our problem. 
um, because uh, you know um, these are like government leaders that. Um, anyways, um, on the mutual respect and, and, and understanding, I think uh, uh, both Afghan nation and Pakistan nation they have uh, many things in common, including our religion, including many traditional values. Um, uh, so we don't have problem with the nation of Pakistan, and I guess both us and the Pakistani nation sometimes have been big victim of wrong policies of our governments, and we have to admit that. Um, um, on the, uh, we are trying to look possibilities of any kind to ensure that um, you know our neighboring countries, including Pakistan and Iran, get honest involved, you know, honestly involved in this. Uh, reconstruction and peace process in Afghanistan because we know that security in Afghanistan is security in Pakistan and we know that you also paid a high price for, for this. Your leaders were uh, assassinated so I, I, I'm sure that you, all, you know the value of, I mean people in Pakistan know the value of security more than um, anybody um, else so I hope that we will all come to this understanding that, um, that we need to become you know supporters on mutual interest for each other's um, um, on the case of India relationship, you know, that is the issue I mentioned before. Like, we are victim of uh, battle powers, basically. <laughs> um, I think some, some of the issues are like internal issues of Afghanistan, uh, you know. Um, I don't appreciate it when I keep receiving uh, comments by my Pakistani friends or sometimes other countries who say, uh, you have seven Indian consulates in your country, why is that? I mean, it's absolutely... It cannot be a source of conflict. It's, it cannot be the reason why we have, uh, you know, conflicts in Afghanistan. Pakistan has also its own problem. Look what's happening in Quetta in Balochistan. Look, uh, you know, how the minorities are being tra treated. Uh, and we never gave ourselves this right to interfere, to influence in, in, in those situations because we respect, uh, you know, your, uh, I mean, the Pakistan absolute sovereignty and absolute um, uh, political sovereignty above all. Um, so I think we will, I, I hope we will, in a way, get them involved. Uh, right now, I know that they are, they are involved in the UK six uh, months uh, peace plan, <laughs> uh, president um, uh, of your country and president of our, I mean, I don't know where you're from, but president of Pakistan and president of Afghanistan recently met in, in London, and I hope that um, that will be effective, and I hope that we will continue these talks. Because, you know, if you ask a woman in North, uh, North Waziristan or in Peshawar or in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or in Quetta, they are suffering the same problems that women in Afghanistan are suffering. So we have to look at it from a human, basically, perspective and see that the war and conflict is uh, basically damaging all the infrastructures in the two sides of the border. On the fruit processing, I absolutely agree with you uh, that we really need to invest on the economic growth of Afghanistan. Um, it, I, wouldn't, I would really regret that after two years still we have to buy those apples that are, you know, with that sweet, tasty apple we have in Afghanistan, we buy that apple that is coming from China or other countries all the way from Tajikistan to Uzbekistan and then come to Afghanistan while there is no packing or storage uh, process in Afghanistan where we could pack our uh, 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 and properly market our uh, products. So I absolutely agree with you on this um, need. Justice is uh, the main element of security in Afghanistan. Our, the international community mistake was that we forgot justice and we forgot too much on security. Right now we have problem with both of it. So I think it will, this, that's why I said we need to have peace with justice. Um, you know, our judiciary system, uh, it has to be a one kind of unified formal official justice system of Afghanistan. I know there are some countries who are promote, I mean, there are some countries who want to support the informal justice system of Afghanistan, which is more traditional, and that is like local councils and local shuras who make decisions on judiciary issues. The problem with that is, uh, you know, uh, it, there is no accountability. Uh, the local shura can make a decision about a woman to be executed or whatever, and then you cannot make anybody accountable. So therefore, we need to have one unified justice system with all the problem that it has. It's slow, it's crap, there are problems, but we need to have one judiciary. Okay, last. Oh, well, an Afghan voice, but at the end then. Uh, uh, this, please. Why don't you collect that? 
Hi. Uh, thank you for coming, and, and uh, thank you very much for speaking. I wanted to get back to something you mentioned at the beginning of your talk about the difficulty that Americans and generally people outside Afghanistan have in terms of getting accurate and reliable information about what's really going on there. And I myself have been to Afghanistan. I worked there for several months, and, and many other people that I know, both Afghans and Americans, speak of what I will diplomatically refer to as an imperfect grasp of the social, economic, cultural, political reality on the ground. And as a result, even the information we do get is pretty difficult to interpret sometimes. My question is, if you could sit down every single man, woman, and child in the USA in a giant room with a bullhorn, with a poster that says, this is what you need to know, what one or two or three basic, most important things would you tell them? Can you put this down? Okay. What do you need to know? <laughs> yes, Miss, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm a high school student from the area, and it's been such an honor to hear you speak. Um, but my main question was, uh, I didn't hear a lot about what you think that the UN, um, the UN's role is in order to kind of aid Afghanistan to kind of come to a place of justice after war, and they do a huge part of sourcing aid. You talked about the Tokyo conference um, briefly, and um, do you think they've worked hand-in-hand -hand with the government, and what do you see as their continuing role um, in order to receive justice for Afghanistan? Okay, the two, take the two. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, Tom has been a great friend for the past seven years, and I will quote one of his um, comments that he posts on Facebook. For me, uh, he said that um, I went through Ms. Kofi's book. Uh, I know it might be very difficult for her to get elected as uh, president of United States, I mean, Afghanistan. But I, I have a message for the U US people. Can we amend our laws and, and make Ms. Kofi our, I mean, elect her as our president? And that was really powerful. It was really nice. It, thank you so much. On the um, uh, two, three issues that, uh, that, uh, that people uh, here should know, um, I, I think, as always, there are so many things that uh, we would like to share once we get to this capital, because we have so many problems. We want to talk about different um, uh, you know, issues that we want to share with them. But one of the things that I think um, we, as I stated in my uh, earlier speech, that we hardly talk about this, is this um, um, grassroots changes that are happening, and we need to keep them. Uh, you know, the changes that, uh, that um, each Afghan woman see in her life by watching to TV, by even having a mobile phone. More than 90% of Afghan people have now access to mobile phone. Sometimes I have, uh, you know, friends who comment on my Facebook or Twitter from the very rural villages of Afghanistan. I'm like, I had to travel three, four days to reach to those areas. Now they could comment on... It's not a sign of progress, perhaps, but uh, it's something. It's something that's happening. Um, the, the second thing would be, um, it's political a bit, but anyways, I will sh sh say it. Sometimes we take risk to share issues. That um, uh, the U.S. should make a choice between those countries who are victims of uh, terrorism and those countries that are supporting. We cannot continue looking at both countries from one glass. That is, you know, I think the important thing that all of us should. Oh, sorry. And now I would Question like to give the, 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 um, um, the floor to two of the um, uh, great voices for Afghanistan and about Afghanistan. Professor Michael Berry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, brief question, and then the rest. Very brief. Uh, a tiny question. You made an extraordinary remark when describing a battle between an Afghan soldier and a Talib. And you mentioned that the Afghan soldier had very poor equipment, a gun that couldn't shoot very far. And you mentioned that the Talib had a gun that could shoot as far as 20 kilometers. Why doesn't the Afghan soldier get that kind of a gun? And where did the Talib get that gun? That's my question. Okay. And uh, Mr. Ekacivek from the UN. Uh, yeah. um, you must be exhausted, but just to bring it back to the peace process. And you said briefly it was not a process, it's a project at the moment. But 
What are your ideas coming out of the parliament, women in parliament, to increase the participation of women in the current projects or processes of peace? Would you rather go for a increase of female members of the High Peace Council? Mm -hmm. Would you see another process? And where in the parliament do you see the contact point? Is this the Security Commission, which has, I think, only one female member? Or is this the International Affairs Commission of the parliament? I would be grateful the for these <laughs> ideas. Yeah. Your final words. Okay. I'm sorry, I missed uh, the question from that um, young friend of mine. Uh, but I will uh, take, take yeah, maybe yeah. during our. Uh, okay. thing. Um, yeah, Professor, the, the, it's a very genuine question you raised. Um, um, I don't know why our. Pro, uh, tr you know, that it was only 2008 when the international community started to provide equipment for Afghan forces. We had a very strong uh, army, but that army was dissolved in Bonn first. Uh, there was 74, arm, um, you know, they agreed on 74,000 army forces, uh, which eventually they increased it. Um, uh, we have now a quite well-trained army. I'm uh, pretty much satisfied with our army than our other forces security of uh, police or department of security. They are well-trained, they are uh, capable of handling operations, but they don't have equipment. I mean, um, it's something that I think uh, international, uh, US uh, primarily, but other countries should really invest uh, um, uh, quite um, uh, um, uh, uh, on a base of priority, because um, if, uh, if our rockets could target three kilometers, then we, are, we have to be worried about it. And the helicopters, sometimes I take those helicopters because it's so difficult to get to Badakhshan, where I come from during winter. It's like broken cartons. You sit in the middle of broken cart cartons. These are from old Russian uh, time that we are using. So I think equipping Afghan forces, um, and uh, you know, this should be a priority. Where the Talib get it, it's if... Um, I was listening, uh, I was watching, um, because I'm supposed to attend the Daily Show tomorrow evening. Uh, it's a program, I think it's a political comedy program. Uh, so for me to get an idea of how it is, I was listening to, uh, to Parviz Musharraf and uh, John Stewart, the program, the last program, where they say, you know, uh, he asked him that uh, where is, um, uh, last time you lied about uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, and I also lied about your book. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, you lied where um, Osama bin Laden is when I interviewed you in 2006. And I also lied because I didn't read your book. And you didn't tell me where Osama was, and later on we found out that where he, he was. So if I really know where they get all those uh, 20 kilometers target uh, rocket, uh, then I don't think we will have problems because we could address the, the, the source of that problem. But that is the truth. That's a re reality that they are well equipped. Uh, and uh, there was a, uh, a war that was on CNN. It was about a, one American soldier, I guess. I watched it the other day. And that is a demonstration of how like weapon and guns the Taliban have. They, they were entering a US space, I think, somewhere in uh, 2009 in Konar in province. Uh, there are many mechanisms that we could uh, increase our uh, woman rule. It's not um, about number. The numbers are important. There are nine women in, in Peace Council. We need to make sure that there are more. I have my own point about the, peace, the current Peace Council, but, uh, you know, women at the provincial level needs to get, get involved. But women issues, you know, like, you know, what is going to happen? Clear picture. When Taliban come back, if they don't come back through democracy but through a deal, to the woman political participation. Like, are, they, are we going to have those women still in the parliament? Are we going to have like five million girls that go to school right now, continue to go to these? These are the issues that we need to have answer for it. And the relevant commission, although you know the, that this process is being so much taken out of parliament um, kind of priorities, Parliament is not in the picture of what's happening really on the peace process, but uh, the, the, the security and, and foreign relations committee both will be the, the line committee to work. Well, now you know why the international community was for the last 13, 14 years in Afghanistan. If we would have more products like that. <laughs>